Hello, hello. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, well, welcome to our panel. It always amazes me that um, there's so many things happening at the fair and there's still people coming to spend time with us. Uh, we are really grateful. So it's actually the first time um, five of us met as a group. Uh, we had Zoom meetings, right? And we had one-on-one -on -one chats uh, individually, but um, it's the first time we sit together in front of an audience. So um, uh, let me start with an anecdote, right? Before we open the, uh, the discussion. Um, and it's something I like to share with uh, all of you, especially with you, Azar. So when um, Stephanie invited me to be part of this panel. Um, I was very excited. Um, it has been three years I haven't been out of China. I feel so isolated. Um, so I got to come to Hong Kong. It's a great thing. But on the same time, I got a little worried. Um, we are dealing with big concepts uh, in this panel. Feminism, um, solidarity, uh, multipolar worlds, and all these big, lofty, um, uh, loaded concepts that are kind of exhausted to a certain degree and how are we going to unpack them and re-engage them, reclaim them in a meaningful way. So um, I got a little worried, but on the exact same day, um, a article uh, pop up on my WeChat moments. And this uh, article is titled, A Letter from a prison uh, in Iran. And because uh, Azar is from um, Iran, and I kind of thinking, of, oh, I want to read this. And it's about a, a women activist journalist from Iran, and she um, talked about how she got arrested for organizing public meetings and uh, put in the prison and how she got uh, interrogated. So it's a very detailed account, uh, lots of like uh, long monologues. And um, after I read this uh, letter, um, I saw many friends are uh, reposting this uh, letter with a message um, that uh, this is actually a Chinese story, a story of a Chinese woman activist journalist, somebody I know. Um, so I, so I, now I know this is actually a Chinese story and to avoid censorship, um, she um, imagined a fictional perspective, um, a kind of a, a Iranian a woman. So the, on the surface, it's, a China, it's an Iranian story, but under it is a Chinese story. So knowing this, I reread this letter, and I found I'm in this interesting space um, that the, the stories are not separate, but they start to kind of um, permeating each other. So I'm kind of going back and forth between a, a Chinese um, activist story and um, her alter ego, this Iranian woman's um, uh, story. So, um, so now I start to think of how we can imagine a creative space of solidarity. Yeah, um, a, a, um, a voice not just from a Chinese person or Iranian person, but um, uh, through this use of a critical fabulation, we can imagine this is a voice shared by a lot of people, men and women in different places with a similar um, um, uh, experiences. Um, uh, so uh, this is something art can do, open up, imagine uh, space and creative form of a solidarity. So that makes me think of you, Azar, before I <laughs> met you, and we are going to talk about solidarity, and that needs a common ground. And um, so by having conversation, we start to found that common ground and build that common ground. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, it was it was uh, yeah very interesting uh, story you shared. Um, this is a yeah, very long-standing strategy or an ancient strategy to, to use the other, um, adopt or becoming the other mm -hmm. to reflect on your own um, story, to be able to, to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also very much, I think, important not to only associate it with, with the censorship or, yeah, yeah. you know, state of crisis or, you know, mm. the, the limitations. Yeah. Um, because um, there is no way, no other way to, to think of your own situation uh, and uh, take a grasp of what you are going through mm -hmm. 
other than um, having, um, having a perspective mm -hmm. which comes from reading your own struggle through the struggles of the other. Yes. So I think we need actively mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to work um, through that path. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it is, when I, whenever I also think about solidarity, it is uh, not, it is less about uh, like constructing solidarity, mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. solidarity. Mm -hmm. It is about like just unblocking mm -hmm. our senses, mm -hmm. our perceptions, mm -hmm. understandings. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are systematically mm -hmm. somehow um, mm -hmm. yeah. blocked yeah, yes. uh, about the fact that we are um, interconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is the basis, right? Yes. Yes. So acts of solidarity mostly, um, for me, it's more meaningful about thinking of unblocking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these, uh, yeah. these senses or yeah. remembering, remembering, remembering yeah. um, mm -hmm. because there are these uh, destructive forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are the strategies and tactics, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so with that spirit and that question, um, let's open this conversation. Yes, exactly. And you know, there is uh, so much deeply rooted in, in the understanding of feminism and solidarity that to differentiate mm -hmm. um, about um, each of our contexts, mm -hmm. but at the same time uh, find, uh, you know, not to end up in the kind of uh, um, pure relativism or, mm -hmm. you know, the cultural relativism mm -hmm. that, um, um, again, somehow lead us to, to blockage of understanding, mm -hmm. to, to think of, okay, this is your struggle, this is my yes. struggle, right? Yes. Somehow like yes. this. And then, yeah, we talked uh, with you a little bit that uh, let's not to unpack these terms um, on a meta level. Yeah. Let's yeah. Uh, really think of No PhD them. talk, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's think about them um, starting uh, from the real ground of uh, um, specifically like working conditions that uh, we are dealing with uh, in the art world, like to, to bring a situated kind of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. background for, for this discussion on mm -hmm. feminism and um, solidarity and, uh, and... And also historic, like ground our experience historically a bit more right, because um, um, we are all um, historical constructs and to a certain degree. So um, I guess the first question is invite everybody go back to your, I guess your um, personal history and tell us what are your early exposures and um, awareness to not just feminism, but a feminine power, um, feminine sensibility. Um, any stories you want to share with us? Maybe Kresia? Of course, yes. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, so I think at the moment we're looking at some images that I just found off the internet to be uh, representative of some of the women that I find to be uh, feminists, but not necessarily, um, they may not necessarily call themselves feminist. And I think it's, it has a lot to do with the word itself being not so accommodating and not so universal. Um, because um, as an African, um, a lot of the concepts I think that we have adopted today come from the West. And um, just as a curious individual, I asked myself, but did feminism not exist? Um, all along, are we only starting to know about the solidarity, the empowerment, um, the significance and the power of women today? Um, where do African indigenous practices of um, feminine solidarity and feminine empowerment um, exist in the narrative? And I found a gap there um, which is where I think my practice has sort of um, existed and a lot of my inspiration comes from in trying to use these um, indigenous African um, knowledge systems to share um, how powerful 
African women are. So Ambia Nehanda, Ambia Stella Chueshe, the women that you see in the slide show, these are actually spirit mediums like myself. Um, spirit mediums mediate between um, the living and the dead. And um, I found my practice as a visual activist to actually not only involve what is happening in the world, but what is happening in the metaphysical world. Um, because some of the stories that I explore have a lot to do with the marginalized. Um, for example, um, activists um, that have lost their lives um, or been victims of violence because of their voice. And um, as, a, as a spirit medium, you are kind of an empath and you are able to pick up on energies, you know? And as an artist, you make art because you have to. So um, it kind of intersects in my research because I'm interested in how I can use the African indigenous knowledge systems to actually um, tell the story of visual activism. Um, yeah, I think we, I think. Yeah, we'll go yeah. back to the spirit medium later because oh, I found of that course. quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, um, uh, Jaffa, you want to share um, some of your stories? Uh, yeah. My my story actually very simple. I always tell um, Mia I'm a very practical person um, uh, because uh, I'm female. That's why I'm here. Um, whatever about the feminism. Uh, somehow I try to ignore that, but people see that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the best way to just do in your own work and people see it. And I think I got the big influence, of course, uh, my uh, model is for my mom. You know, it's just like a very Chinese uh, lady is uh, working hard for the family. You know, uh, she can do whatever the things uh, uh, just want to um, give me the best choice, the best education opportunities, and then give up her career, uh, and then move to Hong Kong. And that is- In the 80s. In the 80s, yeah. And then I feel like I don't understand why the woman sacrificed herself for the whole family. You know, he, she could be a great doctor, and why she just come to Hong Kong to be nobody's in the factory, working the one, you know, uh, in a, you know, as a worker in the production line, you know, mass productions are just one uh, exam exemplar actually. And I, I was all the time curious about that, but in the same time, I have felt like. Uh, I also get the burden because she sacrificed herself. That means I have to perform good. Mm -hmm. So, and then I just wonder why should I do that, you know? And then I didn't, I didn't follow my mom so well because my mom wanted me to be a doctor. And then I come out, you know, just a person working in art. Uh, no one was sure this person will be great or not, but. I started, you know, since I make this choice, uh, I want to study in art, that is uh, 1992. I decided I will take art as my future. I mean, that time never think about artists. That time I only think maybe art teacher. So uh, kind of uh, not following my mom's will, but I decided I want to make myself as individual. So I think that's a very important, whatever sexual gender you are, just be yourself. I think that is uh, important. We female, we got a choice, okay? Or we human being, we got a choice. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I, re I remember the first time when I talked to you, um, you um, 
uh, you said uh, a lot of people um, well, in Hong Kong say, oh, you're female artist. You say you don't have opportunity, but you have a lot of opportunity. And um, uh, oh, you, you just keep talking about your life experiences and, and, and just to win people's attention. But I think it's important to talk about these experiences yeah, uh, I, in a critical I feel, way. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's better to talk about our art, yes. our work. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, that's it. And then whatever, who am I, you know, just name my name. Maybe you don't even see my face. Mm -hmm. Then we just talk about our work. Mm -hmm. So, and then I always tell them, is that fair enough? <laughs> yeah, it's like about uh, talking about your, your world, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the, it's a legacy, right? As, exactly as you say. It, yeah. it is handed to you, and you were talking about it as well. And you, you were also coming, uh, like when we were talking about uh, this li uh, maternal <laughs> lineage um, of... Uh, like, um, when, when, when you were asking about, you know, um, the background, b even before I became an artist, so it made me look back to... Um, there was this moment where I felt like a, I lost um, a sense of identity as a female, um, as a teenager. I, I grew up um, as, a, as, a, as a girl in a very conservative um, traditional school in Thailand um, where I was not really allowed to ask um, specific questions or um, I would not say aggressive questions, but questions that are provocative or you know raise um, new questions. So I was not allowed to do that, and so um, through times I became um, quiet and I became very obedient um, to um, the lecturers, and 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 I really had to follow what what they they told me to do because that was you know a role of a good girl should be you know as a Thai girl in that school so um, and 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 through times I, I even had to crawl um, as in real crawling to like yeah on the on the ground um, which maybe it's it's good to give a context also it was like a special school right it was um, it was um, so it was a, a traditional school in in a palace it was in in the king's palace so um, girls should be even more, um, they would say manner, but they, I guess they use the word manner in order to um, even sort of objectify what roles of women should be. So um, for example, if you would walk past an adult, you would have to um, bend over until, <laughs> Until you know, the, or or um, if some uh, if the adult walk past, you have to really stop, and 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 bow, and um, if the adult is sitting, um, you would have to crawl or you know to talk to them, for example, or to to teachers. If the the teacher is like sitting, you cannot just like stand. You have to crawl and then you know speak from them. So like looking up at them, for example. This is a palace school in Thailand? In Thailand, in Thailand. So that was always my experience until um, I, was, I was 14. And then um, my parents um, um, put me into, the, into, in, into a Melbourne school in Australia, where, you know, I, at first when I, when I went to Australia, I really had difficulties in class because, Everybody was supposed to ask questions, you know, everybody, every um, boys and girls um, had voices, you know, they, they, they would you know, put up their hands and like ask any questions they like or, or answer anything without being fear of being in the wrong. So, and I was, you know, just being so quiet and, and the teachers were so worried about me. They put me into the um, counseling, <laughs> counseling services for like, why are you not, you know, adjusting yourself to the environment? So I was, am I not good enough? What, what's wrong with me? That was, this is what I've been told of what, you know, a good girl should be back at home. But in here, I am problematic now. And then, but through times, of course, I, I learned that, well, actually, I am, I have freedom of speech. 
um, I can I can ask questions if I have questions, and then of course one question can lead to another questions, and then it leads to another ideas, and 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 I think new ideas are important um, to the current you know constructed system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, feminism, of course, it's, it's about the language, also the, the words we have to, to talk about, as you were, you were mentioning, what, uh, when, uh, you know, um, uh, when it used to have a gravity or not, and then revived, uh, or uh, what else do we have? I remember also you were mentioning about uh, oh, yeah. your mother's generation encounter yeah. with, with the word feminism, and I have yeah. my own stories as yeah. well. Um, do, yeah, do you want I, to mention I, about yeah, that? Yeah, maybe I quickly mention that um, the first time I encountered the term feminism was 1995. And that was the year when uh, World Conference on Women um, was held in Beijing. And it was like a watershedding moment in women's movement. But as, as a teenager living in a city far from Beijing, you, you, you just don't care about this kind of thing. But um, uh, my mother subscribed a journal called World Literature, it's a journal devoted to uh, literature from the third world. And one day I saw in 1995, I saw this special issue dedicated to, from Shijie文学, dedicated to uh, I think it's a woman's uh, uh, writing from South America. And I opened the cover. Um, there's, uh, there was a two sentences that's really prominent. It says, women's rights are human rights. Human rights are women's rights, once and for all. And it's quite shocking to me because uh, we never use uh, the, the terminology of rights in my education and the human rights and women's rights and they are equal to each other. I didn't know this is actually part of Beijing Declaration in uh, 1995 Women's Conference. Um, so I showed it to my mom and my auntie. I said, look, there's this slogan on this magazine. And, and they look at the slogan and said, it's, it's, a, it's imported from the West, right? It's, it's a part of globalization. They didn't, they didn't care. Um, so I was, you know, that, that thing just passed, but now I reflect on it historically. Um, I think the Women Conference, um, uh, International Women Conference, was so important for Chinese government to reconstruct its image after 1989. It's a very much a top-down organized event. But at the same time, for um, this conference, there are lots of NGO, there's an a, a NGO forum. Uh, as a worked, you know. it, it worked, yes. And there were uh, about 40,000 women activists from around the world, especially uh, the third world, uh, the global south, came to Beijing to participate in NGO forum, but the government put them uh, out in the countryside, 30 kilometers outside Beijing, and you have conference yourself. But so, and that explains why my mother think it's an important thing, because that message, that grassroots women movement and never connected with the Chinese women mm -hmm. and never connected with, um, um, with whoever is doing any activism whatsoever in China. So, in the, so although this is like an initiative from the Global South, so, but in my mom's eyes, this is an important thing from the West. Mm -hmm. So that message went completely um, a missed, yeah, well, a missed for audience. A reason, for for, for a reason, reason, I think, because yeah. you know that is also like some of the dilemmas of the white feminism. Let's say because these practices, as you were saying, like these uh, the the female uh, resilience, it has been there. It mm -hmm. has its own histories yeah. in any culture, yeah, yeah. but it's been undermined. It's been systematically undermined yes. and uh, yeah. erased. Its histories yeah. erased yeah. And, and internalized also by the women yeah. themselves, yeah. Yeah. This, this lack of it, yeah. right? So then it, it's somehow articulated and packaged and comes as the word like and and you know in in Farsi even like we we didn't translate it mm -hmm. I think in many languages also like a feminism right yeah as a, yeah. as a discourse let's say yeah. right yeah um, so that's why it's inspiring to to listen to like uh, Cresia's story and and everybody's story and to see like feminism has so many let's forget about ism let's forget ism and that that Thank has you. many um, shapes and forms yeah. and it can mm -hmm. be indigenous rituals it can be 
informal economy between women, right? Yeah, but what you were saying is also interesting, you know, this return, right? Mm -hmm. um, which somehow you, you're telling like uh, there, it was even Im implanted top down under yeah. the umbrella of like human yeah. rights, right? Yeah. But somehow it opened the possibility. So it is- um, it, it, po it opened possibility among the intelligence here. Yeah. So after the conference and there are lots of like, um, Western uh, feminist the classics were translated. So it was on the Chinese. table, right? It's on the at table. some point, it's right? on the table, so. and and there mm -hmm. are suddenly there's a women um, conferences, uh, women's exhibitions mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. popping up in, right. in in China and organized by um, male yeah. curators mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, what I was trying to um, like the path I wanted to try to go is that, you know, when we talk about beyond feminism, I mean, there is this uh, reference to the problematics, internal problematics of like the feminism with big capital F or yeah. the ism, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. This and that, <laughs> the F word. <laughs> the F word. <laughs> um, but like, what is this beyond if it is a phase, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how uh, feminism, even as a West westernized discourse, landed in mm. different times, mm. in different contexts, what mm. it does, mm. right? Because it still does something, you know? Mm. We all want to reclaim these forms of like decolonial feminism, other feminisms, adding at the S, etc. But, you know, we are dealing with this uh, deep-rooted patriarchy across classes like yeah. this, you know, it is, it goes, you know, it is, we want feminism, of course it is never um, only about gender rights, mm -hmm. like uh, gender equality. It's always beyond, you know, um, there is no- It has always been beyond. Yeah, yeah, it, there is no other way to think about it because it is addressing the power structures, mm -hmm. being uh, labor, rights, uh, being class, being race. So this is already there, but in terms of like the gravity that it could have mm -hmm. still uh, in um, addressing patriarchy, maybe there is still mm -hmm. something there. Mm -hmm. In Iran, th the word is, uh, is a no-go zone in the official language, in mm -hmm. academia. In, yeah, in, so no it is still so much of a yeah. taboo. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe there is a gravity even to yeah. use the word, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And but for it, us it, also, there it, was this kind of moments uh, of like a right. 90s. Maybe we unpack but, but that at some, uh, in, some in other China, point. In uh, China, it's interesting to think like in 95, you can say um, female powerism. But nowadays, if you translate feminism into female powerism, you get censored. You, you cannot, your publishing, publication cannot go, your show will get canceled. Unless you translate that into femaleism. So you have to remove the power. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Christia, you, you wanted to say something? Um, um, well, I, I think, um, allow me to just uh, take up space a little bit, because I think um, this concept of feminism has a lot to do with uh, resistance and um, resisting patriarchy and um, pushing back against these uh, different um, systems that do not consider women as significant. And um, where I come from, women are really viewed as, as sacred. And um, we practice different um, forms of um, resistance that um, may or may not be acknowledged by the uh, the Western narrative. And um, as you were talking about your first encounter with feminism and what it is all about, I was taken back to when I was also, um, uh, when I also encountered it and um, how I came about to working with the bras that I used to make my uh, sculpture. And it was because I had read a story about, you know, a group of women that had protested in the US, I believe, um, and they had burnt their bras. And uh, the whole story was about the bra being a design, um, a, a, a garment that is designed by a man and then now a woman has to wear it and it's uncomfortable and it's controlling and all of these ideologies. Um, so this piece that you're looking at, um, for me, is 
the African response of what in the West would be stripping or protesting. So um, in Africa, as you see, when women take off their clothes or when they um, remove their clothing in front of a gathering of people, it is believed to um, have a spiritual um, connection and it's, it's, we, we see it as a spiritual report um, or protest, and because women have such a connection to the earth, because um, women give life um, the same way the earth gives life, um, when, when we take off our clothes, we are surrendering to the ground, we are surrendering to the earth, and we are literally taking the matter out, out of our hands and asking nature to resolve the matter. So um, as you may have seen in the picture that I was referring to, there were actually men that were crying um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the people that were gathered around the women that were stripping. It's because they understood and they understand that when this happens, it has a very negative um, effect on um, the community or the village. Um, Sometimes there's no rain um, or there's no harvest because this is how nature will be responding to the anger of women. Um, I wouldn't know how this plays out in the West, but this is how it is in Africa. So we regard women with a lot of um, sacred and power um, uh, uh, connectivity to 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 the spiritual to the spiritual world and to the and to nature, um, such that if women are upset, then we are not able to eat, we are not able to harvest, um, and I think it's also like a, an indigenous practice that is. Um, could be seen as a form of feminism, but because the word itself does not exist in, in, for example, the Shona culture that I come from. But are we not doing the same thing? We are, you know? Um, I guess it's also important for me to share that in Africa, I think before colonialism, um, coexistence and um, the African cosmos as we, knew it was never really about power. Um, we just knew how to coexist. If you look at the cave paintings, for those of you who have toured to Africa and you've come to the caves, you see women gathering and you see the men hunting. There's no um, sort of like fights or battles for power. Um, but I think um, the ideologies. But that human yes. conflict has always existed. You mm -hmm. know, uh, is we we should. It, 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 isn't that a kind of romanticizing view of, um, of that kind of coexistence, or should we, you know, be careful about that? Well, I mean, it's a cosmology. I think yeah. uh, uh, that she's yeah. referring, but yes. maybe in, with modernization, it somehow changed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because um, the modernization uh, uh, and the indoctrination of, for example, Christianity onto Africans um, brought about this worshipping of a white god and a male god, and now the position of women, which was always sacred, be started to become compromised. Um, and, um, you know, there's a story that I, I once heard, I don't know how far true it is, but I found it interesting that, um, you know, the missionary position? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. we all know the missionary position. <laughs> um, do you know why it was called the missionary position? Done by a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. Um, Women were on top, actually. This was the um, natural way of making love. It was the woman that would be on top. But, you know, um, these uh, Western ideologies uh, brought about a change in that. And another example that I can give is when women are giving birth these days, I mean, 
they lie down in hospitals and then they are told to push and it's very uncomfortable and it's very painful and um, you are now drugged with so many tablets and injections just for you to not feel the pain. But when you look at Egyptian um, uh, uh, references of women giving birth, you realize that women were actually standing when they are giving birth. Because, I mean, let's be honest, if you want to go to the toilet, are you going to go there and, st and, and, and lie down? Or are you going to squat? You're going to squat, right? Because this is the natural um, way of nature, you know, when you sleep, you face north. Even when there's a baby, if you place a baby on the bed, you know, if, you f if they face north, then they are less jittery and they are less, you know, they don't cry. But we have employed a lot of um, knowledge systems and um, uh, ways of life that um, uh, are making our practices, our practices as Africans extinct and um, they are pulling us further and further away from nature and um, I think it's, it's quite concerning to, to, to think about um, the position that the woman has in these um, changes and these transformations and um, the wellness around um, the woman's body as we go through these um, changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to kind of extend this idea of indigenous laws and justice, and I I want to bring it to you, um, Kavita, because uh, your work uh, deals with lots of uh, figures and images and laws and justice, and you are telling us you grew up in a family of lawyers and judges. Yes. So, um, you know, we, we see a very interesting parallel comparisons of different understanding of laws and justice. So maybe you can talk about also in relation to your work. Um, well, well, going back a little bit from what you talk about the family, um, I grew up in a law and justice family where every single person in family, except my mom and dad, are lawyers. But we all live together in a, in a big compound where every dinner, we, we would they would talk about their cases. Um, my grandma and my aunt, for example, uh, specialized in um, sex trafficking, um, human trafficking, labor exploitation, and, and domestic violence. And they're all um, intertwined and interconnected, um, um, which is very interesting for me during the time. So throughout the years, I got all of these informations, and I thought, so... I am studying art, <laughs> what, what could I do? Um, the problems with um, the law and justice system in Thailand is, that, is the fact that the law um, is supposed to be well written by the peop people for the people, right? Um, it's, it's written by the authority. Of course, it has been changed um, and developed throughout the times, but it it needs the authority, authority to approve of that, um, which has you know, slowed down um, the rendering of justice system. And so my family thinks that the law, because it, it, it renders justice for all, but we need to push it. So we need to change it. But by changing many of the laws is very, very hard because of you know, um, the system and and a lot of biases um, towards you know, uh, many things in the society. Um, and so um, what could, they cannot do anything as lawyers, as, as judges, right? Um, and, then, and then I ask, so what could we do? How could we um, change the law? If we change the law, then the society could change. And then they say, well, it needs to start from you know, the individual thinking. The law cannot change if the people still have some you know, bias towards many things. And so I think my work is about that. It's about um, raising awareness um, to the people and to make people realize there are so many hidden issues under the red carpet of capitalism that we live in. 
and and a lot of the hidden issues are not even you know um, released or exposed in Thailand. Um, a lot of the news, for example, labor exploitation and hu human trafficking in Thailand, um, which is supposed to, be, for for example, our fishing industry, for example is um, the top top five, within the top five of the world that we really need to change, but it hasn't been on the news in Thailand at all. Yes. Um, and so I, I believe that, um, for example, um, art could be a tool for me to sort of, you know, um, scratching the red carpet and making people see. So what's underneath this red carpet? Or what's underneath um, the product that we consume, the things that we buy, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat? Um, and so this work that is currently show, um, showcasing at um, Art Basel, um, the third hall, if you guys have time, um, is about the exploitation of labor, um, which is you know, my family um, research. Um, the exploitation of labor behind the industrialized agriculture um, so before this I, this, I I did a whole series on you know the female labor that are being treated poorly, um, and also and also they don't have you know enough wages, enough fees to survive um, within the fast fashion industry, and so. Um, when I did that, I was I was talking about you know the hidden labor behind closed off factories, but in this series talks about what about you know the labor um, within the fields that we could see, but we don't really see. You know, it's understandable that something is happening you know behind closed doors and people don't see. But of course, you know even within you know a room. Um, that you could see, maybe you don't see it. Um, so field work is about that. It's about this this exploitation of labor that you would you know drive past every day, but you don't see it. Um, such as you know the cotton industry, um, which is so affected by um, fast consumption and fast fashion. Um, mass production that has made the the farmers have to you know grow the cotton fast enough um, to you know compete with this industry and 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 how to do that so uh, the government signed the the company with you know with so that they the, the farmers could buy this you know seeds um, uh, GMO seeds that you know helps with with the growth of this, but because of the the law and, and lack of policies towards these farmers, of course, um, they cannot you know um, get profit when they sell as much as they invested, and and because these seeds cost so much more than you know the the natural seeds that cannot you know grow for fast fashion anymore. So sorry, it's it's. Too long, but but um, yes. Yeah, so so they when I read on the news, I I um or in Wikipedia if you if you like, um the farmers um commit suicide by drinking pesticides, um chemical pesticides, and and so I was wondering. So I went to India, um and and I stayed in you know, the cotton farms, different cotton farms, just to try to um, um, understand why. What are the reasons? Yes, of course, there's so many reasons, including you know, the laws, the inequality, um, bias, uh, um, and especially towards female um, workers. Female workers in India actually have um, as half of the wage as the male um, workers in India, for example. But, as I, um, and I said, um, why committing suicides um, by drinking the pesticides? Is this a form of protest? Um, and they said, well, a lot of investment, um, but because of the lack of policy, there's this middleman, they cannot get you know, enough profit, enough money to survive. And, this, and when this, um, 
never-ending cycle keep going on. They couldn't, they couldn't deal with it anymore. And the pesticides happens to be a tool that was supposed to, you know, save their lives. But in in contrast, mm -hmm. it was you know the complete opposite. So sorry, it's yeah. the whole thing. Um, but yes, it's. It's, it's what my research is about. So it's about labor expectation, but especially towards um, the female laborers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, I think this is something that resonates uh, very interesting, yeah. uh, interestingly among uh, practices of all you three. And also, um, you know, thinking of raising awareness or giving voice and visibility to the to the suppressed let's say specifically you know um, the women you know each of you somehow chose uh, uh, instead of uh, directly giving visibility to the to the marginal to the oppressed which is one of the tropes yeah. right you're addressing the structures uh, which made them invisible, which made them, um, you know, uh, go through these experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting also the way, um, you know, you, the aesthetic choices, but also, you know, the way you work, you know, you, you use your own body and, and push it to the extreme. And you were talking about how it is about, um, you know, it is almost like a bondage, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it is like this extreme um, uh also pain yes. of, uh, for you, uh, this has a kind of uh, trance, yes. somehow trance uh, yes. experience through which you become the other, right? Mm -hmm. Or you, you push the boundaries of your, your own perception of um, 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 like how you feel the world, yeah. at mm -hmm. least in its mm -hmm. most abstract yeah. way, right? Yeah. Or in, um, in, in your case, Chris, yeah, it is d about this process of, uh, like in your performances, you adopt different characters, you become the, uh, the activist, right? Um, or um, um, you, you are a healer, basically, mm -hmm. not maybe um, directly bring it into your artistic practices, but, um, or in the, in the you know the representational realm, um, which I appreciate a lot <laughs> actually, mm -hmm. but um, you know it's there about like uh, this also like um, the way you are working with these um, legacies of uh, um, healers, uh, female healers, and um, mm, which is also like the ritual is so much of a, of a trans kind of process, right, uh, of becoming the animal or becoming the spirit, becoming one, um, or going um, to the limits of the human consciousness, the human perception, um, um, sensuality of the world. And in, in, in your case, in Jaffa, it's uh, very much, uh, you know, that of a, like a work of an organizer and you know working with with the uh, with the, um, um, collaborators or um, directly working with communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this idea of like um, becoming the scale of justice, <laughs> like yes. injustice, you were saying, <laughs> or the pandolium of yes. uh, like yeah. a, for the balance to, or speculating mm -hmm. what could be the, the balance mm -hmm. uh, of this justice, yeah. or all these different experiences. I think it's uh, very much interesting to, maybe you could expand more a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really want to talk because our background is so different. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be a teacher. I'm still teaching, whatever I'm artist or not. I felt like uh, um, I, uh, in my uh, ten years ago, I made the work is uh, carving uh, the decora universal declarations of the human right. Mm -hmm. So one word, one sentence is really, um, you know, um, felt. I got the insight from that is everyone got the right of the education. Education shape who we are now. And now people see me as a sculptor, installation, in, uh, artist, whatever they call. And then, but think about how many 
women artists work in this scale in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, raised up by two theorists master in university. One is Zhang Yi, one is uh, Kurt Chen. Uh, so both of them male. <laughs> and then, um, so, but I, I didn't become another Zhang Yi or another Kurt Chen. Mm-hmm. I become Jaffa mm-hmm. just because I got the opportunities of this you know, education. And then especially our education is about you know, enlightenment of the human beings. You know. This is really opportunities when you are studying in art and then you so many things you want to question. Especially, I, I, I don't know, sorry, I didn't take any other uh, uh, courses. I just focus in art. And I feel like um, every question, every, like, whatever, social issue, what, whatever, I can consider that in the art critical thinking, how to solve these uh, problems. And the way of artists uh, solving uh, problem solving maybe is a very different. So people, some sometimes a student come to me is about their family problems, but we we just keep our our art way. I would say our art way to talk about that, and then and then you see the gate opened, and then you see there's so many exit you can go. So that is why I would say our education is is super important and and give you know empower the people to be a real human being. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you the, the student come to me is a female or male, I treat them the same. Uh, but when I'm in school, of course, as, especially my master, because uh, very few female or female study in sculpture. So he have to be, you know, treat me nice. Mm-hmm. But in the same time, I'm most naughty one <laughs> because I don't want him to treat me too nice. Mm-hmm. I always challenge him, always give him the question he don't know how to answer. Mm-hmm. And uh, for my <laughs> another teacher, he don't know what I'm doing. I might be the worst student in his class because I'm not logical to follow what he want. But I think that is the power of the education because I think that's why we can be the artists right now. And artists is, uh, uh, if you say feminism in this term, I would say it's about feasibility. Artists have so many limitations uh, in resources, in so many budget. You know, I always always need to count the budget, the loading, the storage. And then, what I'm doing is about feasibility to be feasibility, feasibility but also but also flexibility, because feasibility is about how you make flexibly is emotionally you have to deal with. So that is a female, if you say, mm-hmm. feminism, I don't know. I, 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 I always don't want to use this term. Yes. I, I afraid, we, we, we are all trying to go right? oh, yeah. I'm afraid to use it that, mm-hmm. but you say, whatever you treat me, a female artist or female sculptor, I say, that is the way I try to make myself easier and then to go as the flow to go. I never really plan everything fixed. I always say um, material can lead me to go. I have very good conversations with all these material and all those workers and collaborators. Uh, but sometimes you have to bound because I, I never mind uh, to say sorry, I never mind to say please. Why not? Why the people are so eager to be artists with hello? You know, we are just normal people. We have our normal life, ordinary life. We have to eat and drink, you know, and just be a normal people. And then you can feel maybe be normal is the best way to be a human being. And then um, 
with all the education, you just be a nice human being, and that is good enough. Um, but one thing is, uh, I, what I learned from art is about dare to ask why, and dare to do research in your own to find out what is truth behind, and you dare to uh, say sorry. But, and then you stand up and then work again. Fell down. Because that is somehow, uh, I know some of the people just don't want to, uh, to, to, to say sorry or, uh, oh, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. I think, why not? Everyone, we are not the same. We, we, we are human beings. Imperfect, that's what I say. Imperfect could be the most perfect. And if you, are, if you say you are perfect, I don't know what else you can be, can be more perfect. <laughs> so I don't know. This is a, could be the characters of you know, artists and or female artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I'm thinking about the care. care. Um, I care about the material just like care of a human being. I feel like uh, this is something should not be waste, because so pity if they are waste there and then waiting for ages and no one take care of them. So treat them nice. Um, it's not only to the human being, not only to the creatures, animals, your pet, but also treat seriously to every object. So that is about care we can, we can share. And if you ask me the community project, sometimes I feel like a, embarrassed to say that. I would rather to say collaborative project because um, a lot of people say, oh, you are helping those people. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's not. They help me mm -hmm. to be an artist. You're giving now. back, you know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. give back to the community that you t took from somehow. Yes. Yeah, because I learned a lot of from them. Also, my work wouldn't be here without them. Mm -hmm. So that's why we say that is a collaborative uh, spirit. Uh, it's not just me. I always say in that work, in the encounter section, yes, I'm just uh, one of the work worker there, art workers there. I have to say, yes, I make the concrete, I form and shaped it, I, uh, but welder do the welder's job, and the women workers, they did the, 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 the patchwork, and then every of the, all, because uh, people say, oh, the star is so weird this time, uh, I would say yes, because uh, no one is perfect. No one can do the work without you know, training. But you have to give them the opportunities. So this time, Basel gave me this chance. And then, even this is a short time, at least I can commission those housewife, retired person, they got the, another chance to try something. Because the COVID stopped us for a few years. We can't make anything. Now the new housewife come in and then they want to learn something. And then this is the best way they do something. Uh, they make their own stars, maybe not experienced enough, maybe not perfect enough, but put them all up there. Set, up there. The people appreciate that. Tomorrow they will be here to see how you know, it is. None of us see the work before it hang up. And people ask me, you know, how you can deal with uh, this uh, big uh, patchwork? And I say, we work in the basketball field, outside the small little, you know, NGO office. That is because we are feasible. Mm -hmm. These things is uh, feasible to work in very limited space. And then I am also feel like uh, it's fun. You know, no one say, oh, if I don't have the big studio like that, I cannot make it. So we make it. And then maybe people ask, why you little girls are working like uh, the heavy things? But you know, this is uh, somehow how we deal with the material. 
material is heavy, but the way of dealing the material could be very, I would say, freely and lightly. So I really want to tell everyone, every ladies, everyone, working in Hong Kong, working in sculpture, is not that difficult. Yeah. Because as, as you say, you know how to make things happen, which is, which is the, you know, the real ground of this, this knowledge is that we are talking about, to, to know how to make things happen. And it's knee in. It's the feasibility, you call yeah, it. Feasibility. And you know, being man, yeah, feasibility. Yeah, because know nothing to is waiting to you. Nothing is waiting to you to make it happen. Mm -hmm. It's you make it happen. Yeah. And you, so true. you know, yeah. connect the people to make it happen. That is what artists can do. Mm -hmm. It has to do with her relationship with this community. She's not somebody that is um, um, parachuted in as a researcher or organizer. You are very much one of them. You are, I, I remember you told me, I'm just an art worker. And then you paused one second. You say, I am a worker. That's it. And I was very struck by the beautiful experience you give me, like giving me this tour of the installation at Encounters, and you're pointing out the constellations. Um, and behind every constellation, you start to describe the worker. And, and as if the, the, the imperfection or the quirkiness of this patchwork is the embodiment, the reflection of that person's personality. And there's this um, uh, um, like a really organic affinity between you and the workers. And I know you, you work as a um, as a worker since you were a, um, a teenager. Uh, illegal age time. <laughs> well, illegal, illegal age time as I well. was a worker in the garment industry since 12. Since 12 legal years. time, yeah. that, that time, yeah. legal age is 14. Now I think it's 16 or 18. 14 was legal? That time, oh, that time. 80s. Huh? Yeah, in 80s, but uh, I was 12. So anyway, so this is about domestic work. And uh, in Hong Kong, a long time ago, we do have the domestic industry. People work at home, so no one care who, how old you are. So, and that's why uh, this I keep telling the people, all I, all I work is kind of like a domestic industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the people in that organization sometimes are really like a, a kid of the you know the housewife they, they bring in they are also very happy you know to, to go here and pull this uh, fabric away you know so this is a domestic industry domestic work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it makes me think of contemporary art um, lots of the art based uh, research based practice um, or going somewhere, uh, shooting, filming, taking images, researching, turning into in your work. Um, there is also this extractive relationship to, to the subject of your research, and I see that happen quite a bit. Um, it, it can be um, so. Uh, your work is based on this reciprocal relationship with the workers and also with the materials you work with. So we're talking about this ethics yeah. of care. It's by no means extractive. It's something that um, you, listen, you listen to the material and the material maybe choose you. Yeah. And then you do something and, and, the, and it goes back to the material. So this kind of um, emotional flow and the energy of giving and returning uh, and that reflects in the space and energy of this installation. Yeah. Yes. Um. And then the, I really want to talk about the, uh, because what I say imperfect is because a lot of uh, like a carpenter, they are professional carpenter, they would say, Jaffa, you are doing something wrong. You even can't cut the straight line. And honestly, I just say I just love curve. Mm -hmm. I use jigsaw to do everything. Mm -hmm. And 
I also feel like even you see this uh, stainless steel work, actually uh, those people want to make that. And I, I just feel like I, can, I want to make that you know, from my hand to make the, the clay mold. And then I feel like that is something I want. But and then because of the stainless steel made the worker really to hammers and polish for a long time. And I feel like I lost the connection with the water I want to show. That's why I back to I back to studio. I do that in wood again because that is something I can control. I can directly talk to the material to see what they respond to me, so it's a very different. And then, and then you see the concrete uh, in the in the uh, encounter section. Um, even the welder told me, this is like a molding things. You just ask the worker to work for you. It's easier because you are so, you small. You know, you are like a girl. And then, and then I trying to tell him. I can work, it's not because I'm better than them. I would say I'm just more feasible to accept the fail. Mm -hmm. Because the concrete is just very difficult to control. You have to be flexible to respond to the, the shape. And uh, you, you saw the belly one. Actually, the, it was a fail one because the concrete slide too much, and then and then I shaped it. You listen somehow to the to yeah. The because uh, if you are not there, how you can respond directly? Mm -hmm. This is a relationship I treasure. Yeah. And just like uh, the spirit of the nature, even that is not really, I mean, uh, from the earth. But I treat the material they are in the planet. I respond to that directly. To acknowledge their agency yeah. somehow. And you could also, Chrysia, somehow <laughs> expand on that, like the way you, you also work with the um, you know, slow processes of collecting the material uh, that then you use for your installations, and then the question of waste also, which is um, have been uh, we could go back to that, <laughs> but maybe for now. And we want to hear um, about the spirit medium. Yeah. Okay, um, so in uh, the collection of my material, I'm interested in how I can uh, capture or present um, the essence of women's labor or the essence of their spirit. So I've been... Um, experimenting, you could say, with the bra. As you can see, Dr. Stelanyanzi here uses her bra uh, as, a, as a tool of resistance or as an object of resistance. And um, I, I prefer the bra worn because it carries the um, residue of the individual or the woman who would have worn it, um, the stories of where she would have gone, the work that she would have done, and particularly the sweat that um, she would have, um, you know, uh, that would have come out of her body during whatever form of labor that she um, practices. And um, in terms of working with um, a collective or a group of women, I. Um, in some of my work, I have done uh, a research in a, a high-density suburb in Harare in Zimbabwe where I researched the lives of um, sex workers because I'm also interested in the stories of the marginalized. Um, I think I am somebody who's passionate about standing in for, um, for others or standing in for voices that are silenced and um, I stumbled upon a group of sex workers when I was doing some photography work and um, I, I found a story there and um, I was fortunate that they let me into their homes and I was able to kind of um, understand and learn what that experience is like and how harsh it can be and um, I think 
the story of how one survives against all odds as a woman can be so gruesome that um, it's not a story that is often told. And I think a lot of our society, a lot of the societies that we come from have, um, are very conservative. So anyone who practices uh, a, 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 a form of labor that involves their body or that involves sex, they are kind of shunned upon. And I asked myself, so where do these women belong and uh, where does their story exist? So working with the bra is kind of a way in which I weave a story or a language which can uh, bring to light um, the struggles that they face. There's also a very careful sensitivity, I think, that I try to place into the medium um, as I also explore mixed media paintings and textiles where I use the petticoat, which is also an undergarment, and I paint on this petticoat. Um, I think maybe you saw a green painting in the slideshow, and that fabric is actually um, a, a, a petticoat fabric. So it's really about trying to be very sensitive to material, trying to be I'm very close to the body because I'm very concerned about um, issues concerning um, uh, uh, the wellness of the female body and how it can be brought to a place of healing, especially when it has gone through traumatic and uncomfortable um, experiences. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> Medium. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I think um, my practice as a spirit medium uh, makes me... Not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily, not but... Um, you just want to hear. You just want to hear. Okay. Well, yes, I, I, um, I mediate between the living and the dead. I, um, I come as one, but I represent many um, from my maternal, from the ocean. Um, I am a healer of the spirit, so I cannot heal your cancer or your... Um, you know, whatever sickness you have, but I can heal your spirit. And um, I think uh, this is a, a part of me that helps me to um, be very sensitive when I am telling other people's stories. And because I mediate between realms, I think in my practice I also mediate between um, an audience and the marginalized and um, yeah, this is how I kind of find my balance in my human experience. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> your, your body is a time travel machine, you know? It, kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of inhabited by multiple temporalities, right? Past, future, and, and present almost simultaneously. Well, but anyway, um, a, a question of body to Kavita. Um, you, when I look at some of your um, videos, especially with your, uh, some are quite um, some t sort of violent to your own body. You know, you use your body as your, uh, your material, and sometimes this being out of body experience that uh, you are sort of experiencing through this process, right? Yes. So um, I think it's it's very important for me to um, to understand even a glimpse of what it means to be. Um, objectified or dehumanized or machinized, so being objectified as machines. Um, there are a lot of protests so in Thailand and also um, in other countries that I went on to research. Um, um, the, the workers are holding up signs and saying, are we machines? Um, it really hit me because I think that as much as they are working repetitively every day, competing with the machines that are gradually replacing their jobs, they are being treated as machines. Um, every protest that they come out, um, the news would not, you know, would, would ignore, uh, would not release their words or what they're saying. So in a way, they are muted. Their voices are muted. Um, and I feel that so I know that, you know, as, as a person, I have, I'm not a laborer. I, I cannot um, understand what they are feel, their feeling um, being objectified or being dehumanized every day. 
into machines as they feel. Um, but at least I could taste um, even you know a, a glimpse uh, of what it means to be that. So it, I really need that you know moments um, within my you know thirty minutes, one hour, two hours of my practice in my performance in order to understand even a little bit. And, and, and finally being a messenger um, for these laborers um, and these cases that has not been exposed and expressed, um, especially in Thailand. And so, um, but of course, when you say the word violent, and I, I think uh, the strange things about performing is the fact that as time goes by, you know, it, it feels really painful, um, of course, you know, crashing onto the ground, or I do a lot of performances where I felt it felt really painful that I could not stand it anymore um, in, in the first few minutes or in the first, you know, 10 minutes even. But then as time goes by, the, my body be, became really numb. Um, and by being numb, it sort of started to like create this illusion that it could endure this uh, objectification of a body. Um, I, I, I had to perform the scale of injustice for, um, so on the left side would be about half hour, so all together would be like half a day. But as, as when, I, when I crashed onto the ground, I was telling my friend, you know, we, I, can, I could do it, I could do it en endlessly, and my friend said, are you sure? Like it feels like it's it's painful, it's violent for your body, and feel, and I said no. Let's let's keep going, um, to a point where when I stopped doing the performance, I when I touched my leg, I could not feel my leg anymore. I scratched it. I could not feel my fingertips mm -hmm. on my legs. Both of um, uh, the, the, the top parts of my legs. I pinched it, I could not feel it. Um, so I went to the hospital um, and the doctor said, you know, your um, uh, nervous system has been, you know, temporarily died. But it will grow back um, within, you know, two or three months. Uh, but it <laughs> that's, why, that's why you could endure it. That's why you could stand the performance because you could not feel <laughs> that your body has been sort of violated into a machine. Uh, and I was like, oh gosh. So not, not only um, I was physic, um, no, I mean psychologically convinced that I was a machine and trying to endure and, and confront within this difficult performance, but actually my body believed. My body believed that I was that. And, 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 and so, yeah. You had the uh, transformative moment. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, not, not in a good way, <laughs> I believe. Um, and, and, and the doctor said, you know, you, you know what, you should really be careful. Um, when you convince yourself that you're something and you're pushing yourself, you're pushing yourself to a point. It, it's like you're living in this norm that, that people say that, you know, you should be like this, you should be like this. At first, you think, "Oh no, this is not right. This is not right. This is not um, this is not human rights." But the norm keep you believe that you know this is this is this is normal. Mm -hmm. Then psychologically, physically, you feel that it's normal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Normalized, you mean within it, the system? It's been yeah. Your work. your mind uh, and your belief system has been. Uh, normalized into this, and this wrong this system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, almost at the end of the, <laughs> the time. <laughs> it would be nice to open up to the to the ground uh, if someone has comments or um, points to share. Take your time. <laughs> also, you had a question here. Also, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to open it up to the panel here, what you thought, because what I'm getting from this conversation that occurred to me, so I just thought to share it with you and maybe filter it through your experiences if it rings true or what you think, because the sense that I'm getting is that a lot of our 
trouble and problem comes from a sense of bodily consciousness. Mm. And if we are to understand that we are souls, then the souls actually don't have any male or female gender. Mm. What do you all think about that? Why me? <laughs> um, You're in touch. I, I, You're I, in touch I will, with them. I will, I will talk about it later. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And I think um, it brings me back to uh, the contribution that I made earlier when I spoke about the African cosmos and how we coexisted without any power relations. Um, and now I think the whole concept of feminism becomes very problematic because we are trying to find power and we are chasing power and we want power and um, power in the wrong hands is oppressing another and um, one might say women are taking up too much space and then women will say but we should take up space and men will say, but it's a men's world, and women will say, well, you can't exist without us, and it becomes a tug of wars, really, but I think just understanding that everyone actually has a feminine and masculine energy, and um, we are uh, unable, I think we are struggling to find the balance um, within ourselves, um, to understand that we do have the feminine and the masculine within ourselves. So maybe societal constraints and challenges are forcing women to become more masculine and um, that becomes something that nature looks at and it says, but you have a role, you know, you exist in a woman's body and why are you fighting to become a man. And um, I think, yeah, I, I don't know if, it, if it's making sense or, or helping and understand, but it's, it's, I agree with you at the, at the end of the day that we are just uh, spirits that um, uh, uh, are existing in, 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 in bodies. And I think if we can acknowledge that we both have um, elements of the masculine and elements of the feminine and we try to find a balance maybe we can um, uh, come to a different level of consciousness yeah can, can I say something it's not about we maker it's also about the material itself because the uh, people always say rock you know like uh, men do it or wood carving men do it or textile women do it, female artists. So that is why I, uh, it's not by purpose, but just occasionally <laughs> I make all these materials, you know. Uh, so I, this is also the message I try to encourage uh, all the art practice, uh, practitioner, you know, it's no differences of being male or woman and also the material don't have anything, it's like a belonging to which gender you are. It's about how you play with them, how you talk to them, how you respond to them. You can have your own way. It's not necessary to follow the old traditionals, uh, you know, what um, other people is doing. So I think that it's a very important to, you know, open up all the opportunities to all the genders, and also the material itself. Thank you. Um, Kavita. Uh, Kavita. Yeah. Well, um, I believe that, you know, since birth, we have been sort of programmed to believe and to have a sense of who we are by the society, by the environment. We go to school and everyone, you know, treats us um, in a certain way and, 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 and do education also. So everything around us has programmed us. And, and that program has put to us to, to have, you know, this sense of self, this sense of identity of gender, I think. 
Um, but I, 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 I mean, um, you are right. In reality, um, are we just, you know, are our reality just <laughs> stimulations <laughs> um, in this, you know, connected program or, um, you know, we are, we are being programmed to believe that this is real, this is real, this is right, this is the truth, but we don't know really what it is. So I believe that, um, I believe that you are, you are right. Um, we are, uh, I, I am a Buddhist and I believe that the truth is, maybe it's just emptiness. And maybe we're just this um, running program of stimulations after stimulations, and 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 you know. But but while we are here, and while we believe that this is our reality, we have to we have to collaborate. We have to work together. Um, I believe that working as a collective community. Like what we're doing now, it's 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 very important um, because this is this is our matrix now, mm -hmm. and how do we improve this matrix? As we are put in this role of gender, yes, we know that you know I'm here because I'm a female artist, um, as you know, according to um, the organization and everyone in the world. Um, but yes, I know that. Um, um, my, maybe my identity doesn't really matter. Maybe all of us identity combined is what matters and the message that we're trying to say. Uh, my message only doesn't matter, but all of us mm -hmm. are discussing something and maybe new ideas, new ideas of this such hard topic of what is, how do we create forms of solidarity mm -hmm. in this in this multipolar world, such a hard topic, and nobody has any idea what it is, what it could be. But I think working as a group collectively, I think collective is 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 an important is an important symbol. It's a good point. Word. It's a good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we just um, yeah just um, Close uh, closing yeah. remark for, from each of us. I think it's a very good question, and it opens up. Um, a lot of critical potentials to think about in the future. Um, for me, um, I think being a female or talking about feminism is not just in the realm of gender, it's also an ethics, ethics of care. Um, and as, as we're talking, I just put down um, you know, the tropes of ethics of care uh, we're talking about, non-extractive relationship, um, reci uh, reciprocal relationship, returning, exchanging, body as a repository of knowledge and memory, healing, feasibility, flexibility, and I will add kinship, kinship of human material, planet, and spirit. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was lis like, like listening to you also at the beginning comments. Um, quite important to think like how uh, we could go beyond this like um, position of fighting back, you know, the fight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the struggle, um, like feminism as a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. But there's been a reason, you know, there's been a reason also, you know, that uh, all um, forces of reordering the world, there is a reason why it is being associated to masculinity, right? Yes. So we are not um, um, in that world which is uh, like a, in which um, both masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. uh, have their own spaces. Mm -hmm. But it is quite important to think uh, um, how to adopt these more affirmative mm -hmm. approaches instead mm -hmm. of just being forced to react mm -hmm. uh, to this world, which you know, even even trains mm -hmm. the forms of solidarity. You know, there are forms of solidarity that we want to adopt, mm -hmm. and there are being, uh, forms of it which are, which we are being pushed to. You know, this like very uh, fast, uh, you know, reactions, 
or the whole attention economy around like something is in crisis, there is death, there is like extinction, and then that is the force for, for showing solidarity. Like how could be other forms, more affirmative forms? And what you were saying in, in terms of, um, you know, how to make things happen, that re resonates so much with it. It's about like world making, right? Uh, instead of just uh, pointing out what is wrong with the system, right? Which is quite important, which is quite important. But to create your own spaces of sanity, to, to find ways to make things work, to, to, which is, I think, in. <laughs> A question of class, I, I would say, because you know by heart that uh, no one would give it to you. Yeah. You should make it work yourself. So, and this is also like in 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 a more um, another scale, you know, from places that we come from in lack of infrastructures, or let's say when you're yeah, born into, yeah, when you are born into a broken world, mm -hmm. right? You uh, you know by you know very fast, like more than I, I mean. I, we are almost all in this this phase of understanding that you know we should create our, our own world. But I think for when you're born into a broken world, yeah. right, you know maybe faster uh, that it is about making your own world, and it is not a, like a single-handed journey. Like it, you you need others. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to do it. Like it's you are not a donkey shot, right? And all these like male figures, like heroes, right? It's like all these constructions um, um, are, have been there. But um, I think um, you were uh, very very sharp in bringing up the uh, this attention to the fact that artistic production or cultural production is never about only production of content. It's always about production of one's own working condition as well. Yes. Yes. And if we attend it to it or not, it's yes. happening. Yes. But uh, like how actively in our um, geographies, let's say, when there, there, are, not, n there are not these infra infrastructures for um, um, producing works, then you not only have to produce work, but also create the means mm -hmm. of, uh, create the possibility of, uh, possibilities of production, like material conditions of production as well, yeah. which is about world making, so. Uh, um, Can I, one, one note, uh, because when you talk about hero, uh, people start to talk about hearing, and I try to say, it's just a team. It's not a singularity about individual hero or heroine. We just kind of, everybody is the same. We are contribute at all, you know, all the people contribute. So it's better back to a teamwork. I think we have to close this panel. We are already um, beyond the time limit. But um, yes, yeah, thank you so much for this uh, conversation. And uh, before uh, when we f we met on Zoom, you know, and uh, we but uh, today we already feel like a collective, you know. And um, I think uh, yes, yeah, Stephanie, it is a match made in heaven. And I thought today's conversation is perhaps beginning of a long-term collaboration. And let's make the world. Thank you.